Cozy keynote, which is John Malt. John is a fellow of the Institute for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research at the University of Maryland and professor in the Department of Cell Biology and Molecular Genetics. He is a co-founder and chair of CASP, the Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction, an organization that conducts large-scale experiments in protein structural modeling, which I guess quite a few of you have probably participated in. He's also co-founder and co-chair of KG, which conducts community-wide experiments to advance genome interpretation. His research interests include the relationship between genetic variation and human disease, computer modeling of protein structure and function, and large-scale community experiments. It's a great pleasure to have John here today, and he's going to talk to us about community-driven critical assessment. How well does it work? What have we learned? And what next? Yeah, I, I kind of regret the very ambitious title. I can't do all that. Uh, so what I am going to do is try and give you some kind of flavor from my point of view about this sort of research and its features and what its strengths are. I know a lot of you know what the weaknesses are, so I'm not going to talk about those so much. I do want to push the strengths and try and uh, get some discussion going about how we can go further. So you all know this on the first slide is a list of some of the current critical assessment experiments. Um, some people had the temerity not to start with a CA for their names, but they actually do critical assessment. And um, this started, I think, with uh, Christoph Fidelis and I starting CASP in 1994 with the idea of trying to find out what we can and can't do in the area of structure modeling. Uh, it's spread since then to a lot of things with proteins, but as you know, also a good deal with genomics and a good deal with systems biology. Uh, my own involvement here has been in a number of sort of advisory capacities, but I really want to focus just on CASP and a little bit on KG today because those are the ones where I've got the deepest experience. Actually, I don't want to say very much either about KG except to update you on where it's going. We had a session on KG last year. Um, I'll get to it in a second. So I think you all know this. What's common to all these CA stars is two things, I think. One is that you try to compare very directly computational methods with experimental data. Well, everybody does that. There's always benchmarking in any uh, such experiment, any, any study you do. But the key difference is that you're trying to do it in cases where you don't yet know the answer. You're doing prediction rather than post-diction. And from the start, this for us was a key thing, and I think everybody has adopted that. The other features, people have adapted to less or more. So the next three, many challenges, each petition, participant makes many predictions, and a lot of people making predictions from whatever community it is, are things which give you statistical rigor. And the extent to which you can get statistical rigor varies from area to area. One thing that we do in CASP and some other people have adapted is something called, uh, here I've called authoritative external evaluation. And the idea here is that if you keep doing this for a while, you get very ossified, you get very stuck in your ideas, you develop a nice cozy community. If you have people coming in each time from outside, and telling you what to make of the results, I think that's a very powerful way of trying to keep the thing fresh, trying to keep it current, trying to keep it relevant. Now, I know some of the CA star organizers don't agree with that. Um, I think I insist on it. Um, you do need some kind of repetitive uh, regular schedule. Most CA stars work on looking at current uh, experimental data and trying to address that as it comes up. Uh, I think CAFA is an interesting exception with this idea of let's make predictions on everything and then see what turns up later experimentally. But the outcome is the same. You can regularly look every little while at what's going on and see if you're making progress. If you're just doing it once or twice, obviously you're not going to get very far. Okay, so first just a little bit on KG just to update you. Uh, KG, as you all know, um, run by myself and Stephen Brenner, uh, aims to try and assess how well we can determine the relationship between genetic variation and phenotype, particularly for human disease. Um, 
Uh, we've run four of these experiments so far. The two pieces of news I want to relate are, I'm glad to say that finally we have got together a publication for KG. There is now a special issue of human mutation officially coming out next month, most things already online and available. And the second point is that we are currently launching KG5. I think you all know this already, those of you who get the newsletter, but we're very much looking for new participants. Um, we're going to have a prediction season running from August through November. We're not quite sure when the conference will be, but it'll be sometime between spring and summer next year. Okay, that's the KG plug. Let me go back to the main theme. And I'm going to develop the theme on our experience with CASP. Um, CASP, as I said, started by Christoph and I uh, in 94. The current organizers, well, the current organizers through CASP 12 were Anna, Christoph, Andre, uh, Taunston, and myself. Here we are at an organizing session, doing a lot of organizing, as you can see. Um, uh, organized by Anna last year uh, in Rome. And Anna, as many of you will know, was a um, central figure in CASP for many years. Actually, from CASP 6 through CASP 12, she was one of the organizing committee and really the, the central sort of organizing figure in the whole organization. And from many points of view, uh, it's very difficult to see what we're going to do without her. But she was great also at taking us out for nice dinners. Okay. Um, so, uh, I think I'd like to do this from a historical perspective to see where we've come in CASP and how we've got there. So I want you to cast your minds back to 1994, those of you who were born then, and think about um, what the situation was in terms of our understanding of the relationship between protein sequence and protein structure and what questions obsessed us at that time. So it had been established in the early 60s, actually, by the work primarily of Christian Amphinson, that there is, if you have an amino acid sequence of a protein, under appropriate conditions, all of the information that determines the corresponding structure, in this case an experimental version of that structure, is contained in the sequence. Once that was identified, it opened up a field of research. Obviously, if that's true, you should be able to say what the structure is given the sequence. And that was a practical problem and has been one of the backgrounds, perhaps the background that's driven CASP throughout its history. But there was another question at that time and a question which became more pressing between the 60s and um, the 90s when CASP started. And that is, what's the nature of the actual folding process? It's a different question. It's really a theoretical question. And it was highlighted by a paper from Cyrus Leventhal published in 1968, so sort of five or six years on from Amphinson, in which he pointed out that there's a very large conformational space for a protein. You all know this already. Um, and so if you take a 100 residue protein, there are something like, depends how you count, 10 to the 70 possible conformations. How does a protein find the conformation in some simplified sense? And at the time CASP started, there were a number of different models out there to answer that question. Here are three of them. Actually, there were about seven, and some of you will be familiar with these. There were discrete pathway models, very favored actually by experimentalists and good experimentalists. This is data from Susan Marcusy, and the idea is that this folds first, then this, then this, and this, and she had beautiful experimental data for that sort of process. There were statistical models which said, well, it's something like that. Some bits tend to fold earlier, but it's not as cut and dried. And dominating the field in the early 90s, the idea of a protein folding funnel in which essentially, uh, if you think about the Leventhal model, it's a flat playing field with one little dimple in it where the global minimum is. And a number of people, particularly Peter Woolenies, said, well, that's dumb. Obviously, it's not a flat surface. It's got this kind of funnel-shaped uh, feature on it. Okay, so CASP in some way was trying to address in a muddled way we didn't really think through both of those, both of those questions. You could, before CASP, you could ask at that time, well, how did the field look? How were we getting on? So we're about 25 years after Anthonson. People have been working on this problem. Where have they got to? So obviously 
you go to the literature to answer this question. And the sort of thing you'd find in the literature are these kind of papers. So uh, this was one in Science from 1990, which said, I can fold up proteins to about two angstroms backbone RMSD. This was one in 95 saying that don't worry about what we're going to do with all these human proteins. We've got an algorithm which will give you the structure. You don't have to wait for the experimentalists. Here's one from me actually doing um, loop modeling in comparative modeling and saying that oh, don't worry guys, I've solved this problem. I can get small standard deviations from X-ray structures for loops. Don't worry, you don't need to worry about that problem anymore. As you all know, these assertions were wrong. And they're wrong today. We've made a huge amount of progress, but we still cannot fully answer these questions. Um, and so the motivation for CASP, and I think the motivation to start with, and again, I emphasize to start with, was to try and say, well, let's see if we can think of a way of sorting this out by doing blind prediction and find out what we really can or can't do. So I'm, what I want to do is follow through one of the things that happened in CASP and give you a flavor of how it unfolded and what, how we got to where we are today. Before I do that, though, I have to, as usual, emphasize that a lot of what we as organizers have deduced from this is with the help of these independent assessors. Um, and um, there's a list of them here. You'll know many of these names. And Anna actually was one of the main contributors here early on before she became an organizer. So. Stepping back and looking at the whole 20 whatever years of CASP, how would I sort of characterize it? Could you think of a single word? I tried to think of a single word. I couldn't. I had to have two words. The first of these words is a kind of obvious one, and that's progress. We don't have answers to those questions um, that, 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 I, that I said completely. But on the other hand, the field has gone from, I'd say, an arcane academic pursuit to a really practical, useful set of tools that biologists use every day. I think Taunston's server Swiss model handles about one model a minute coming in from biologists who trust at least some of the tools which we now have to deliver them useful information. Now, you could argue how much of that is from CASP, how much would have happened anyway, but there's no question that over the period there's been unrecognizable change in what we can do. It's true it's a long time, but it's still nice that it's happened. Well, how did it happen? And for me, the word that I characterize with how it happened is surprise. That at almost every turn, what I thought, and I think the other people involved as well, expected to happen didn't happen. Methods we thought had a lot of promise just disappeared, and instead, other things took their place, and we got insights and methods which were unexpected. And in retrospect, that's been really the main satisfaction. The main satisfaction, it sounds funny to say, but it's really what science is about in some way. The model you have in your head is wrong, and you go out and do something, and you say, oh no, the world's not like this, it's like that. So let me give you, in one theme actually, to do with ab initio structure prediction, two of those surprises, just to illustrate what I mean. And the first part of this will be familiar to some of you. The second part, I hope, is, is new. So this is the problem of folding up small proteins without the use of a template, what those papers mostly were about in the early 90s. We thought before CASP then that we must be able to do something. We knew the papers were exaggerated, but surely we'd have some ability to do it. And the first surprise was a nasty surprise, and that is we could not do anything in the way of unassisted modeling in 1994. It's a famous slide uh, from Fred Cohen, who was the assessor in this area in CASP-1, and um, you can see the top there is um, the, uh, the template, you're trying to, the structure you're trying to reproduce. It's a very simple fold. Today, there would be really no problem at all with this, but the sorts of efforts we could make were, in a word, pathetic. This was a surprise and a nasty surprise. And um, it went on being a nasty surprise for several CASP. We went through several rounds. We came back after two years of hard work. You'd think we might sort something out, seeing where we were, but we didn't. We came back two years later, bad. Came back two years later, bad. 
came back two years later still, and famously there was one nice result. And that's this uh, structure here, superimposing the model on the template, um, on, the, on the target structure. There was no template for this. Um, the only thing about it was it was one model from one group for one of the targets we had. And if you looked at it in comparison with the other groups on this plot being down and to the right is good, being over to the left is more random, you can see this stands out as one very exceptional model. And it wasn't clear whether this was some kind of flash in the pan or we'd really made a breakthrough. Well, to cut a long story short, we had make a breakthrough. That was CLASP 3, 4. If you go forward to CASP 9, these are every two years, right? So that's a long time already. We saw more and more of this quality of prediction for small proteins. And this is summarized on a plot from Joel Sussman then in CASP 9. Um, and what you're seeing here is in the squares, the performance on some scale that goes from 0 to 100 of uh, the CASP 9 non-template-based targets. I don't want to talk about this much, but roughly over 50, you'd say, is a pleasing kind of model like that one I just showed you. Random is down here somewhere in the 20 to 30 range. So most of the points are up here in uh, the above 50 range if this is size along here you're less than 100 residues. There are exceptions. Uh, we've got excuses for those, believe you me. But the important point is that in this region, not always the same person, but somebody would deliver a good model. For bigger things, though, whatever methods these are, they did not work. OK. So we've gone over this period of a very long period to be able to do this. What were people doing? What methodology worked here? And the answer is it was fragment assembly methods. So um, probably many of you know this already. We still do not have templates for all of the domains by any means. But on some length scale, we've seen all the confirmations that are out there. So if you take 10 residue chunks and you look, you'll never see within about a one angstrom resolution, and almost never, a new 10 residue confirmation. We've seen them all. So you can make a library of fragments you take a, frac a chunk, the first 10 residues, let's say, of the thing you're trying to build, you test it against your library of fragments, you pick out the ones, it won't be one, it'll be a set, that might correspond, and you, take, you do that for the next 10, and then you've got a pile of com things to combine. You do a combination of maybe 100,000 different combinations and try and evaluate which of those might be the correct structure. So. Uh, Fragment, uh, come on. Fragment library, select your fragments, assemble them. Here's an example of one of the more successful uh, targets done this way in, I think, CASP 8 or so. Um, why does this work? It actually works because short regions of the chain have a lot of conformational preference. If you looked at the sort of Leventhal argument, you should be about 10 million different observed confirmations for a short piece of chain. And actually, if you pick about 10 for a given sequence, it's enough. So you get a huge reduction in the size of the space you might expect because of short range constrictions on uh, what a chain can do. So to sum that up, what we learned was, if you go back to the Leventhal argument, you talked about this big flat surface. You're a blind putter on this thing looking for where the little energy minimum is. Uh, it, and uh, the argument was, well, this is wrong. There's really a funnel here uh, leading you to this minimum. What this method said is, though there isn't actually for these small proteins, you don't need a funnel. It's just that the space is very, very much smaller than you expected it to be. It, you can still think of it as flat. I mean, assembling all these different decoys is, a, is treating them as a flat surface, but you just don't have as big a surface because of this local conformational preference. So that was a surprising outcome, at least for small proteins, about why they fold. OK, let me go on to the newer surprise in this area. You saw we were stuck at 100 residues or so for these methods. We're no longer always stuck there, as many of you will be aware. And the reason we're not stuck there is because of the success recently 
of three-dimensional contact prediction methods. And you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with most of this. This is uh, from a review of Alfonso Valencia. Uh, Alfonso and Chris Sander first suggested this might be possible in a paper actually in 1994, the same time that CASP started. And of course, if you have two residues in contact, that implies that if you have a multiple sequence alignment, there'll be a correlation in the residues you find at the positions there. And so uh, if you take all of the pairs of, of columns in an alignment and calculate, let's say, mutual information, you can find the ones that are in contact. That's what uh, uh, Alfonso and Chris Sander suggested in 1994. Um, in 1996, in CASP2, we started to look, is that the case? Does it work? We introduced a special category for contacts and invited people to predict them. Uh, and so people did, and we looked how well they succeeded, and the answer was, well, okay, so looking at the L over 5 most confidently predicted contacts, where L is the length of the chain, right? Those are the numbers I'm going to quote. In CASP2, success at contact prediction accuracy was 8%. That's to say 92% false positives. And that wasn't very encouraging, but we went to CASP3, that's the thing about doing it repeatedly, right? And it was a huge improvement to 15% accuracy. Not so far up, but we're going in the right direction. We kept going, and the accuracy went up to about 30%. So 30% correct, 70% wrong. And it actually plateaued there for a long time. This is, I think, from CASP9. Uh, this is the assessment result, and we're interested in these blue bars, and this is ranked by different groups now, and you can see the best groups have an accuracy in the low 30s. And this had been the same for so long that I was totally convinced this was never going to go anywhere, and I argued with the other organizers that we should chuck out contact prediction. There were actually good theoretical reasons in my head why it would never work, and it had saturated and was a waste of time. Fortunately, Alfonso in particular argued with me that we should leave it in and see what happened, and of course he was right. Um, what happened, as you know, was in 2011, several papers from Chris Sander, from David Jones, and others were published pointing out that we were not using the right methods here, that the theory, this, mul this mutual information thing, was flawed. Um, that was in, we should have seen a result from that in CASP 10 already, which was in 2012, but in CASP 10, there was no progress on this front. And I thought, yes, yeah, is another one of these dud ideas. All the time these people are saying things that doesn't work. Come on, guys, let's chuck it out. But we didn't chuck it out. And in CASP, um, in CASP um, uh, uh, 11, we had a message from the assessor of this area, Nick Grishin, the organizers got this message from him. He said, look at this, this is the model, this is the target, this is about 300 residues, it's a two domain protein, and really um, we'd never seen anything like this uh, in terms of accuracy for something without a template in CASP before. And his comment was, either the group is close to solving the folding problem or they cheated somehow. Um, <laughs> There's a story out there that I got on a plane to go and talk to the people who did this to see if they cheated. Actually, it's not true. This was David Baker, and I was in Seattle anyway, and I never thought he cheated. I just wanted to know what he did. And, of course, what he did was contact predictions and new contact predictions. And um, that was, again, there were just two targets in CASP 11, but in the most recent CASP, there are a number of targets where these methods have worked. And this is actually, to give you a sense of that, this is from... Uh, Alexandra Bovon, who was the assessor for contacts. So again, this is it's called precision here, but it's L over 5 accuracy. Um, this is the CASP 10, where we should have started to see something, and we didn't. Um, and you can see, actually, slightly different definitions here. The accuracy is in the 20s. And then in CASP 11, where we saw just those two cases, there's a little bit of an improvement. But then in CASP 12, there's this huge improvement in accuracy going up to... 50% in predicting contacts overall. And that's for all of the targets in the uh, non-template-based category. Um, in CASP, uh, and if you looked at that in terms, again, this is that accuracy scale, 0 to 100. This is the precision, the accuracy of predicting contacts. And you can see the better the contacts were predicted, the more accurate the models are. And there are many of them over here, over, over 50 on this scale. 
And astonishingly, the L over 5 accuracy for some of these targets is 100%. Every single predicted contact is correct. Now, uh, I think the reasons for this are, are very intriguing for the field in general. As you know, the explanation here is what there was a fallacy in what I just told you about these mutual information columns. The snag is that, yes, A is correlated with, A is in contact with B, they're correlated, but also B will be in contact with C, and so those are correlated. And so there's a knock-on correlation between residues A and C, which often will not be in contact, and you get many more of those knock-ons than you do the basic ones. Now, this is a problem which was well understood in the 80s in statistics, and there's a matrix inversion treatment, which actually people have now used as one of the ways of treating it. It's also well understood in the areas of statistical physics, where, for example, there are maximum entropy treatments. And for some reason, it took our community something like 20 years from the initial paper to the good results in CASP to see what was going on. I think you could look at that in two or three ways. One is we got there in the end. The other is, what else are we missing? Where else are we using an inadequate theory? And that certainly sent a lot of us off, I think, looking at various things. Um, I want to go back to the issue of why we need CA stars in computational biology. That business with all of the papers I described at the beginning is a very strange situation. In all of science, there are occasionally wrong papers published, but for all of us to be publishing wrong things is unusual. So why was that? And for me, this is a very fundamental thing about the nature of how we do science. Why is it that Western science is so successful? When I went to school, they told me it was because I would learn to have a lot of personal integrity and I would carefully try to challenge all my ideas. This was actually put very well by Karl Popper, who said we should try and throw out any hypothesis we've got by looking for data that disagree with it. We all know this. But very, very few of us are capable of that. We all get emotionally attached to our ideas. Why, then, do we manage to succeed? We manage to succeed because of the second thing that Popper said, which is we may not be able to criticize ourselves, but other people are only too happy to. I mean, the converse of believing in your own ideas is you don't believe in other people's ideas and you're happy to criticize them. Now, what we've done in Western science, and this is really amazing, is we've taken that rather base kind of thing and we've institutionalized it in all sorts of productive ways. If you think about being a scientist, at every turn, you have to be criticized by other people. You have to get a PhD, somebody's going to criticize you, I don't like this. Somebody, you've got to get a job, you get a job, you've got to have tenure review, you've got to have grant review, you've got to have paper review. We all hate this, but it's the reason the system works. And we should not forget this, because it's very important to maintain these institutions which are under continuous attack these days. But this is a continually evolving system of regulating science, and it's evolved to regulate experimental science. And the thing about experimental science is you're constrained by the real world. You want to do something, the world is not the way you think it is, you won't get anywhere. But in computational biology, we don't do that. We construct ex implicitly or explicitly a virtual world. And the problem with having a virtual world is you can change it however you like. So, you know, this, this is an example of an online world and it's full of friends and cool places and entertainment. And there's always this temptation, which we can't resist, that we will tune our virtual world to do the things we want. So uh, for me, personally, I was once a crystallographer, and I was stuck for 15 years trying to recrystallize a protein. I was not smart enough against the real world. But when I became somebody who folded up proteins, I'd look at where it went wrong, I'd see I'd got too much solvation energy on the charges, so I wasn't getting the salt bridges, and I just turned down that parameter a bit, and then I got salt bridges and folding. So you're in charge of your world. And um, what you can do with a CA star is control for that a bit, not be in charge, and um, uh, uh, get forward with, with the field. 
I want to make one final point. We started this with this let's find out what we can do, let's control things and so on. But for those of us who have been in these CA star series, it turns out to be an immensely rewarding and deeply intense form of science. I've never, you know, I, 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 both in CASP and in KG, taking part is just amazing in terms of how it drives your thinking. And so I think there's much more we could do as a community. Um, we're interested in several areas where let's not just check against experiment as a community, let's try and answer new questions as a community. So I think in terms of the future of CA stars, they should become systems for answering unanswered questions instead of just checking against experiment. Okay, I've probably overrun, so I'm gonna stop and thank you. So thank you very much for the excellent talks. Um, I would like to hear your insights about the future of the direct coupling analysis methods that you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you think that because uh, about five years it stays stable, it's not really much Im improvement. So you, do you think that is oh, rich, is in up, up, uh, is rich, is optimal? Uh, definitely not. Okay. Um, I think, first of all, it's not true it stayed stable. I think in the last, between CASP 11 and CASP 12, the, you know, this measure of how deep an alignment you need is, is, a, is a soft number, but it's gone from something like 1,000 to 400. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, I think as the, uh, Jim Beaujou's talk yesterday showed, there are many other factors you, combine with this, you can combine with the straight contact stuff, and I think that has not been worked through at all. And thirdly, of course, we just are getting more and more sequences, so the potential is, is, is going to increase a lot. Yeah, thank you. And um, do you think in the f what's your idea in the future? Maybe we have some other theoretical framework that can break proof. And what's your... What is it? What you inside about that? You have to wait for the next CASP. <laughs> 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 oh, seriously, I wish I knew. Um, so thanks for a great talk, John. Really enjoyed it. Um, so the, the uh, direct coupling analysis, I think, has been just such a major breakthrough. Yes. But when people talk about this a lot, they mention Jones and Sander and so on. But I think it's really important to remember that in, it was 2008, it was Martin Vaigt who yep. came up with direct coupling analysis. And he kind of, he gets forgotten so often that I feel yep. honor bound yep. to just yep. 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 <laughs> Actually, the original person was somebody called Alan Lapidus in 1999. Mm -hmm who tried to publish this and for some reason didn't succeed and it's sitting in a physics archive. Yeah. So I, you're right though, I, that, that, that's important work um, from, from 2008. And there, were, uh, there are others, I mean there were several people who tried to get this going. Uh, and it's again curious how long it took to really take off. I think you know, Chris pushed it very hard once they published and then people started taking notice, but it, it yeah. wasn't the, the first people to, to notice. But we didn't have enough sequences too. Ah, well, guess, that's so. true, but, but it's important to remember that the, the early methods do not work with more sequences. So we've looked at that, a number of people in CASP have looked at that. It's not just that we've got more data. It might be that in 1999 there would be very few cases, but you still could have demonstrated it. Thanks. Okay, as it's now into the lunch break, we'll stop there and you can have any qu further questions, you can go up and ask John. <laughs>